Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Alex Paul from InvestorStream and I'll be your host this morning. Today we have Kalina Power Managing Director Ross McLaughlin who's going to be providing us with an update on the company's Alberta projects which are being developed to deploy cycle power plants utilising the Kalina cycle technology. As I mentioned off the top, it's a different format today. We've been inundated with questions from investors so um, by and large it'll be a Q&A format but please feel free to keep sending through those questions. Um, you can do so by navigating to the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, you can also email them to me, alex at investorstream.com.au. A lot of you have already used that platform to submit your questions and we really appreciate your input. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Kalina's quarterly report's been out today, so you can download a, a copy of that by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel. Uh, a copy of the webinar will be available on Kalina website and social media platforms later today. Uh, Ross, if I could just get you off mute and so, um, so you could join me. Hi, Alex. Thanks, Ross. Thanks for joining us today. Um, before we get started on the questions, I I've picked up a number of your announcements over the past week or so, uh, and obviously the quarterly uh, report has been released this morning. Uh, before we get stuck into the questions, um, is there any are there any sort of uh, high end comments that you want to make off the top in terms of the quarterly report? Um, no, I think uh, I think we uh, we can get through our presentation today. I think one of the key things that's been raised by a number of folks uh, uh, just indirectly uh, through back channels has been questions regarding our cash position and where we stand. And I think our, our, our uh, I believe our quarterly does a good job addressing that. But I'd like to also discuss a little bit about that uh, when we get to any of your questions regarding uh, where we stand corporately in, in your questions. And if they're not there, we'll, uh, we'll cover them there. Perfect, Ross. Well, look, the first question, sort of, uh, we, just so we all um, we're all aware. So, I, I've basically um, the questions that have come through, they've been in. I've sort of put them into sort of five or six distinct categories, and the first one's projects. So, Ross, if we may uh, get a start, your, your business plan has changed from 21 megawatts to 30 megawatts to 32 megawatts to 64 megawatt plants. Uh, that, that's quite a substantial change. Um, or ongoing change, if you like. Can you just talk us through the background of that, and can you tell us why? Sure, um, Alex. The uh, in fact, the business plan itself hasn't changed, but certainly the scale of these projects and the implications from that have changed for sure. Um, you know, anyone that's in any infrastructure business will always tell you that uh, the cost to develop a small project are disproportionately higher than they are to build a larger one. So the efficiencies that you can get out of increasing the size and the scale uh, are obviously welcomed uh, welcomed changes if you can get them. When we started this exercise, there was a regulatory uh, ruling in the province which called for distributed power generation, which could only provide a maximum of about 22, 23 megawatts to each of the distribution transfer stations in through, spread out through the through the province. Um, you now, without getting overly technical, at each of these at each of these uh, transfer stations, there's a number of feeders which you can feed electrical generation into, and most of these uh, transfer stations have one or two uh, of the feeders. And so what we did is we looked at the market opportunity. We decided that we would we would be restricted uh, to provide a maximum of 22, 23 megawatts. And that's why we selected a gas turbine, which was 15 megawatts in capacity, had 40% of extra power generated with a clean cycle to give us 21 megawatts. And that's how we arrived at the 21 megawatts. Fortunately, during the process of that whole exercise, since we started, the regulatory rules changed uh, positively. And that allowed us to change the rules from saying you can only deliver 22 megawatts to a transfer station to 22 megawatts per feeder. So suddenly that opened up an opportunity for situations where we could look at two and three, sometimes four feeders in a transfer station. That would allow us to build plants which would be 30 to 32 megawatts in size. So our maximum size that we're doing in any of our plants Still, our projects now are designed at 32 megawatts in total size. But each of the locations that we're looking at, some of them are capable of handling only one of those configurations, so a total of 32 megawatts, while other sites and other locations that we've identified are capable of handling two of those plants, and thus 64 megawatts. 
hopefully that explains a little bit of that. The other, the other reason why it's also increased is when we began this exercise, we were finding that we we're able to get about 30 to 40% extra emissions free power with the Kalina cycle, with the gas turbine. But over the course of this whole exercise, with all the engineering we've been doing with our team, power engineers and Interflex, we've actually increased that now up to about 50% extra power. So a combination of the regulatory changes and energy efficiencies through engineering have resulted in this bigger scale. So Ross, what are the expected cost and revenue synergies with the new 64 megawatt plants and how does it affect KPO margins? Yeah, a couple of things which uh, which might uh, just be make common sense here for the for, uh, for for the average listener would be that you can understand that the the permitting costs and the uh, and uh, and the regulatory costs and all of what we call an owner's cost to develop a project, those costs frankly are about the same whether you're doing a 32 megawatt pr plant, a project or you're doing 64 megawatts or even or even larger. So the very fact that we can build a larger scale plant with costs which are spread over more megawatts, for, for lack of a better word, just screams for greater efficiency. And that's one of the big advantages that we get. The second advantage we get is operational efficiencies. Uh, the, the staffing requirements really are incremental, uh, almost negligible for an extra plant when we're putting two plants together on a 64 megawatt project. At the end of the day, effectively what we're seeing is it reduces CapEx by well over 10%. I don't want to use a, a too large a number and uh, and have people hold me to the final number, but I'll just say it's well over 10% in terms of a CapEx reduction, and it improves the margin certainly by about 15%. With the new emphasis on 64 megawatts, will the 32 megawatt sites ever get done, or is all the progress on those sites wasted? Well, let's remember we have two very uh, good uh, 32 megawatt sites. Um, uh, one of them that we're keeping really, really uh, uh, close to our vest that could get deployed uh, perhaps sooner than we than, than we than we had uh, current or f previously thought. But just remember this: each of those projects at 32 megawatts, and any other subsequent 32 megawatts, in other words, single trains or single plants that we build per location, they will be brought on stream with a lot of the front end engineering costs already covered, a lot of the development costs already covered. So th they will come online at a much lower overall cost uh, because of the work that we're doing right now on these larger projects. And so they will become that much more effectively deployed. Their numbers uh, may not ever be quite as high and as good as the 64 megawatt projects, but there's a limit to the number of 64 megawatt projects we can build. Um, and uh, we recognize that. But these 32 megawatt projects will be that much more uh, cost effective once they're built uh, on the heels of these si first 64 megawatt plants that we're deploying. Now, regarding the pipeline, can you describe loosely the amount of effort or money that's gone into the pipeline, uh, into the pipeline sites, and you know, give us a feeling for the likelihood of them proceeding? Um, now, I presume that the 320 megawatt site is not just a fanciful figure that's been pulled from the air but rather serious sites that have already undergone a thorough investigation and confirmed that they are suitable, attractive sites that are with a, a high likelihood that we may develop. Uh, it's a little bit of long-winded, long Ross, but basically, could you just talk us through um, the, the pipeline logistics? Sure, and if you don't mind me saying this, I'm doing I'm doing this, of course, without the camera, and I'm smiling as you're mentioning this, because when you talk to, uh, talk to folks uh, such as ourselves in Western Canada, and you start talking about pipelines, we want to make sure we're talking about pipelines in the, in the sense of what the marketing uh, uh, opportunity looks like in terms of the projects that we have in the quote-unquote pipeline. But for, us, for those of us from Western Canada, pipelines mean uh, pipelines that are carrying natural gas. So I'm a little bit careful with that, with that terminology, but I understand your question. Um, I think it's very important that uh, investors understand that we have had a very diligent and very um, uh, deliberate process in identifying the sites and load locations in Alberta that we wanted to go after. And, and this really involved uh, a, a triangulation, if you will, of looking at the proximity to gas supply, uh, the proximity to interconnection infrastructure at these transfer stations, and the electrical load and requirements or demands from industry and communities uh, over the grid. 
Uh, those three had to be triangulated. And from that, we were able to identify a number. I think it was probably at one time, it was about 18 different sites. We quickly narrowed that down to about a dozen. From that dozen, we've continued to narrow that down to actively go after and pursue and start spending money on the number of projects which we have in our, in our, uh, in our, uh, under our belt right now. And each of those projects initially, just to get through that phase that I'm just referring to, would probably be costing us somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to $100,000 to get to that screening process. And then from there, we do an interconnection study uh, with the utility to understand what those actual loads really are and the likelihood of success of doing that interconnection. Uh, from that, if that's successful, we then proceed to a $100,000 study that they do. The results of that 100000 study uh, are that they will provide us with a firm fixed cost for themselves to do the interconnection cost for us to be able to tie into the grid. So this whole process takes, you know, uh, the screening took several months. Uh, the, the, uh, the initial phase of, of, of the preliminary environmental, the preliminary interconnection work, that takes around three or four months. And then these $100,000 studies, they're somewhere in the neighborhood of around six to nine months in duration, all of which there's engagement with ourselves and the utility and others during that whole process. There's been quite a bit of money that's been spent on advancing each of these projects. So when we talk about 320 megawatts currently in, sorry, in, uh, in development, these are in various stages of project development, but I can tell you that they've been well, uh, well vetted and in several cases, certainly our primary site, well advanced in terms of the various uh, milestones which have had to been completed. So with the increase or change in project scope and the FNTP now anticipated in Q4, can you explain how the construction timeline now looks and when will the first 64 megawatt, megawatt site come online and when will the following three sites come online? You know, um, I, I will tell you that we have very good dis, uh, uh, visibility in terms of what the first primary site is going to look like. We're looking at a uh, an FNTP date sometime in the fourth quarter, as you've mentioned here, uh, of, of this year. And and uh, from that from that range of time frames, we're looking at about 18 months to get through to COD. Now, I will tell you, I will tell you that, that the variability on that is up to the final selection process that we're going through with the key major equipment vendors. And we alluded to that in our last presentation. We're going through a vetting process with the, with the major vendors for all the major equipment together with Interflex to get fixed prices, but also just as importantly as fixed prices. Alex, please understand, this is also about a fixed schedule that they have to commit to. Because you can't you can't do a well, you know project that's in, you know well over 100 million dollars uh, and 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 be uh, held to ransom because someone you know can't meet their scheduled delivery dates and hold up everything. So just as important as the cost estimates is the scheduling. So we have a sense that it'll be about approximately 18 months from FNTP until we bring on uh, the, the 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 construction is finished and we get to COD to go forward and the plant is turned on and activated. So about 18 months after after that period. But that, those final dates will get nailed down once we've made our selection on the key vendors. And that's all happening right now as we speak. And I think we should be in a position together with Interflex to make those final decisions here in the coming weeks. And then of course, they then turn to delivering us a turnkey contract that'll nail that down and it'll all be firm with firm dates. And as for, as for your questions for the next three projects that follow, uh, I can't talk to you about all three projects, the next project. What I can tell you is our current plans are for our primary site to come on board in the fourth quarter, uh, sorry, go to FNTP in the fourth quarter of this year. And our second 64 megawatt project, which we do not have site control on yet, but we are very actively engaged in getting that, on a couple of more sites for 64 megawatts for site control. But the second project will probably trail the first project by approximately six to nine months. Okay, uh, Ross, now we've, just so I can deal with the project funding, it seems like an, a natural um, segue into the project funding. Uh, the plan cost looks like it has increased to around $90 million now. Um, and the recent announcement has $900 million worth of projects for 320 megawatts, which equates to about $180 million per 64 megawatt plant. 
are Akira still in for 70 million or will they cover half of that? Well, let's just look at roughly what our numbers are. Just this, this will give some guidance in terms of what the rough numbers are. If you're if you're looking at a single 32 megawatt plant or facility, uh, we would be we would be thinking to ourselves that at this point in time, the costs for all that are going to be you know let's just call it a bit over or slightly over 100 million dollars. But if you put two of them together, uh, together the costs are slightly less than 100 million dollars each for the two of them, just to give you some some sense of the uh, of, of the scaling issue, et cetera, so what's at stake. So you're looking at, you know, slightly somewhat less than $200 million, or roughly the numbers that you're, that you're referring to a minute ago in your question. But um, um, the, those prices then will be fixed and nailed down as a result of the fixed price turnkey contract that we get from Interflex. And we'll have absolute definitive numbers, and we'll be able to let the market understand what those definitive numbers are, once they're definitive. And uh, uh, we think we're tracking very nicely in respect to those CapEx projections. We feel we're doing pretty well with that and with, through the competitive process that we've gone through with all the major vendors. Akira, the deal with Akira hasn't changed. Akira is still looking at providing up to $70 million in project equity for our two, first two plants. Well, if the first two plants are at a facility that has two plants, that's what they're looking at, providing $70 million in equity. And the rest of that would come from debt, from for, from project debt. So, Ross, with each update, Kalina seems to be promoting bigger and more extensive potential. It, it, it seems more like a marketing exercise. And I guess investors want to know who is funding these expansion plants. Is Akira likely to be the project funder for these additional plants? And when can we expect to hear how this pipeline will be linked to an infrastructure fund or, or other potential uh, financial uh, outlets? Well, I, I think I have to be very direct here because Akira has is, uh, is, uh, stepped up to provide us with a commitment. We want to respect that, and commit, respect that commitment and honor that commitment. And Akira is there to fund the equity and arrange the debt on the initial two projects uh, two plants, rather, that uh, that we have in the queue. And they've been kept up to date and abreast of all these changes in the scope, et cetera, et cetera. They will have that opportunity to fund or participate in funding of additional projects. They may wish to have an opportunity to fund all of them. Uh, they may wish to want to participate with others in funding more of them. That remains to be seen, to be fair. But at the end of the day, you know, one of our uh, one of our guys on our team, in fact, several other guys on the team all often use this refrain, good projects find good financing. Now, almost all of the groups that we spent a lot of time speaking with in New York and Toronto and elsewhere uh, have all expressed participation in getting or expressed interest in getting uh, participation or having some level of participation in the plans that we have going forward. But right now, our commitment is to our funding partner, which is Akira. And for that, we know that our job is to deliver them a very good project right now that can, can that, that includes the first two uh, of our Kalina Cycle Combined Cycle plants at our primary site. So your financing agreement with Akira was for two plants and 60 megawatts or 140 million. Now that the scope's changed, can you talk through how that may impact the financing? Sure. You know, Alex, simply put, um, the one thing that I just uh, is, gets, keeps being reinforced all the time, it's a lot easier to fund larger projects than small ones. I mean, the, the, just the efficiencies are just there. Uh, and infrastructure funds, frankly, would rather deploy more of their capital uh, more efficiently. And if the returns uh, are, are good and they get even better, uh, because the larger scale and the larger size and the more that's involved, uh, that fits most of their requirements. So um, to me, the concern, if, it's, if the question suggests any concern, I would, I would want to put that aside very quickly by saying uh, the size of our projects, the larger they are and the more profitable they are, uh, attract more interest, just generally speaking, with all these different infrastructure funds that could be there to, to provide additional funding, let alone Akira themselves. I mean, at one point we were looking for 21 megawatts to do, as we mentioned earlier, and, and if that was up to two plants, that would have represented you know, 42 megawatts for $140 million. Now we're looking at 64 million dollars, sorry, sorry, 64 megawatts you know, for, for somewhat less than $200 million. So the efficiencies and the effectiveness of that capital being deployed, there's more capital that can be deployed at higher rates of return, fits very nicely.
Ross, is the finance agreement with the Kira still the same as originally announced to the market in 2020, or has it evolved with the change in project scope, or is it likely to evolve with the change in project scope? There has been no change at all, um, and that's it. There, there, there has not been any change with our uh, agreement with Akira at all. I mean, I think it's also probably worth pointing out that, that there are likely to be a number of different sources for the project debt on this project. And when Akira and ourselves were initially looking at it, there were a handful of banks in Western Canada um, that had uh, that they had been in touch with that um, um, felt this project was suitable for, for for what they were looking for, as long as we could contract the gas supply agreements in such a way with the tolling contracts with gas suppliers to mitigate the risk. And that's what we're continuing to march down in terms of uh, in, in marching forward with. Um, but in the process, of course, of, of us getting closer and closer to, uh, to uh, advancing these projects uh, in a real meaningful way, you know, we've begun having lots of conversations with different uh, project funders to provide that project debt. And uh, there's quite an interest. And um, we understand most of the criteria that they'll be looking to, to, under, to see uh, that, that are met uh, by these projects. And uh, we're pretty excited with the level of uh, engagement that's going on, not just with Akira, but also with other, let's call it other organizations that are looking not just to provide equity, but would be more importantly looking to provide project debt for the projects. Thanks, Ross. We're just going to move on to uh, some regulatory uh, questions now. Can you describe in more detail how big a derailment to the small-scale energy sector, or in particular low or no emission energy, um, that, that would be created by the removal of the DG credits? Um, and I guess from a macro perspective, is it is it just Kalina or would the whole sector fall off a cliff? And with so much coal-fired power plant, um, oh, so many coal fly plants coming out of the system in Alberta. Um, I imagine they can ill afford to lose energy out of the system or prices will skyrocket. So can you just talk through the impact uh, of the potential impact of the um, the removal of the DG credits could, could create? Yeah, sure. Uh, Alex, um, to begin with, uh, and I just want to make this point because we made it in our, in, our, in our last news release. I mean, the DG credits have been around for actually now over 20 years, I think 21 years, uh, they were implemented for a reason. Uh, and the reason was that if you could build power projects close to where the demand was, you would be saving the grid and the transmission costs associated with transferring those electrons from centralized power plants hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away from where the demand was and all the losses up to 12% of energy losses on transmission lines. And you'd be saving the grid uh, tremendous costs for transmission. You'd also be improving the grid stability. And all of those benefits were deemed appropriate for the province to encourage distributed power generation. And these distributed power generation incentives were there to not really provide an, a, a direct incentive to, the, to, to, to companies, but it was an incentive pro program to incentivize companies such as Kalina and others to build projects in these regions where the demand was there and they could save, there would be savings. Because we create, distributed generators create a savings to the system, there are DG credits which are calculated as a percentage of those savings to be passed through to distributed generators. And that's what this program is all about. And there have been, for years, there have been talk, people talking about, you know, whether they should continue it or they shouldn't continue it. Is it the right thing to have? Is it not the right thing to have? And it's, up, and it's often up for review and it's been up for review from time to time for, for most of the life of the program. Um, th when the new conservative government came into play, they wanted to create some some certainty, some regulatory certainty around the environment. And rather than have it continued to be up in the air, they wanted to create some certainty. And that certainty has created, a, obviously, a case in which some proponents want to see it discontinued entirely. And other people want to see it completely continue as it is. Frankly, at the end of the day, I think what we will see is we will see either a continuation of the program as it is or something similar to achieve the same result. Because without it, without it, I can tell you right now, 
many of these small renewable energy companies that do not provide baseload power like we do. We can run all the time. We can be running our plants all the time in baseload power with a combined cycle, Kalina cycle, with a gas, a gas power turbine. We can be running all of the time. But the renewables, such as sun, sorry, solar and, and wind, are, are, are not in the same situation. And without this program, it would be devastating for them. So I just find it really difficult to accept. Most of our team finds it difficult to accept that there will be something so uh, so radical a change uh, as, as to completely remove the program. So just following on from that, Ross, what lobbying efforts are being made to the Alberta Utility Commission and their proposal to discontinue DG credits? Well, uh, well, twofold, frankly. I mean, um, you know, we have one of the best regulatory executives in Canada on our team, uh, Julia Siglione. She was uh, with members of the Pristine Power team, as you, many of your, many of your investors would understand. Many of us from the Pristine Power days. I was only on the board with with the company at, at the time, of course. But for all of those, those that were associated with Pristine Power, it was one of the, you know, one of the premier independent power producers in Canada, and and she. Is, is frankly one of the best in, in the country. And she's on her team right now. And she frankly uh, engaged legal counsel and profiled Kalina as an industry expert in the AUC hearings and all the filings. And our positions and our position papers were met with uh, great regard from everyone involved uh, in the program. And she has actually gone out and now engaged, uh, or not, no, not now, but in the last few months, engaged a very, very prominent lobbying a group that won't, won't just be helping us with respect to the DG credit matter, but also the overall landscape for waste heat to power and also geothermal in, in Alberta. So I think the profile of Kalina, even though we don't have any of our plants up and running and built yet, I can tell you right now, the profile of Kalina in Alberta uh, um, is, uh, is quite, uh, quite uh, recognized. So just on the FNTP now, Ross, if I can, does the delay in FNTP hold any significant um, any significance in terms of unfavourable weather at certain times of the year, or will the timeline to operations of the plant stay at 18 months from the FNTP? Can you describe the advantages of the modularisation here? Yeah, that's actually a great question because that that fits in very nicely why we're doing modularization. I don't want the I don't want your listeners to believe that if I said weather does not have any factor because of modularization, that would be an exaggeration and 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 not correct. Um, because we still, at the end of the day, have to take these modules into the field and have them installed. But I don't want your listeners to think is that what we do is we say, oh, great, okay, we've got FNTP, and then, you know, like 12 months later, we go into the field and start construction, and that's not what happens. What will be happening is because it's 18 months later to come on board, that means there's a whole bunch of events and number of things that have to happen. And yes, there will be times when we cannot get to the site and do site excavation and site work, the civil engineering with the roads and the foundations and things which will be necessary. But we will have enough time in our calendar uh, of the year in order to be able to get that civil work done well in advance of those modules arriving. So even if those modules, for example, were to arrive in the winter months where it's really very, very cold, et cetera, et cetera, um, it could have some delays. But the reality is we're planning for that. That's why we have a lengthy schedule around installation time lines that are probably longer than we need because we're just trying to give ourselves enough, let's call it enough latitude to be able to overcome any of those kinds of concerns. So weather is an issue in Alberta, but it's simply less of an issue, but not not a completely minimized issue, but it's just less of an issue because of modularization. So just moving on to some commercial opportunities now as well, Ross. Uh, on March 23, you, uh, you made the announcement uh, that you selected Siemens as the preferred gas turbine vendor. Um, and in that announcement, you mentioned that you selected them for a number of reasons, including the capability of being modified to use hydrogen in the future. Can you explain the significance of this and how does it fit into your future plans? Well, in a phrase, um, future proofing. Future proofing. We didn't choose the Siemens turbine only because it was capable of handling hydrogen to be able to blend hydrogen with natural gas as uh, through a transition to eventually get to hydrogen. We chose them, we chose Siemens and we chose the gas turbine 
for a number of reasons, including, including future proofing. I, I don't think you know, lots of people are, have strong opinions on this matter about hydrogen. And, and I don't think this, this call should have a discussion in this call. We, we shouldn't be making too strong a position either way. Whether hydrogen is you know, near or long term, it remains to be seen. But we want to ensure our projects can be adapted to accommodate the hydrogen promise when it becomes available. So I think future proofing our project was an important consideration selecting Siemens turbine. And frankly, that added a heck of a lot of extra time to our process to finalize the negotiations with Siemens uh, and get to the deal that we got to with Siemens. It added an awful lot of extra time, but I think it was really well worth it. And I don't want the listeners here on this call to believe, oh, our projects are doing hydrogen in Alberta. Um, our projects will be capable of running on hydrogen in the future as hydrogen becomes available in the province of Alberta. However, now that you've raised the point about hydrogen, I think we should be understanding that there is, I think, a role that we can see for our technology to reduce the carbon footprint and the energy intensity associated in the production of hydrogen. And um, I, I can't tell you much more than that on this call, but I will tell you, it's not something that has been lost on us. We've been looking at this very closely. It's one of the sectors, as we look at the transition economies and the trans transition technologies that are going to take us through to a zero emissions or you know reduced emissions a power generation world, and hydrogen being one of the paths to get there, we're recognizing there are opportunities along the way where Kalina cycle technology can play a role in making that happen. And we'll, we'll talk to the market more about that as, as, uh, as, as events unfold. Now, does current work directly enable Kalina's Canadian subsidiary, Kalina Distributed Power, uh, to tender with confidence for industrial waste heat conversion to electrical power on, um, on, a, com on a competitive basis? Sorry, sorry, Ross. If I can word it another way, um, I guess the, the current focus for the for the company. Um, how does that enable clean and distrib distributed power to tender for industrial waste heat conversion to electrical power, uh, given the the space and the market that they're operating in? Oh, good, because that's what I was hoping you were meaning. Because because I think that's a that's a that's a really good question, and I think it's highly relevant. It's a highly relevant question for a, a few reasons. In the process over the last year or so, our team has gone through extensive, extensive comparisons and analysis on different heat sources in the particular application we're involved with and other, other industrial waste heat to power opportunities. And we now have way more, be way better information and data with which to now claim that we're not only competitive to various alternatives, but especially, especially against uh, or with comparison comparison to ORC with certain applications. Uh, let me just give you an example. With the waste heat to power application that we have right now, taking waste heat from a gas turbine, when we started this exercise I mentioned earlier, we thought we we're gonna get about 30 to 40% more power off of that gas turbine. ORC would have produced about 25%. Today, we're at 50%. That's a that's not a slight improvement. That's an orders of magnitude improvement over organic rank and cycle. So that's an amazing thing. And we have the data, et cetera, that back it up. However, however, when you have all that data, that's all great, but you don't have what we call a product. And our near-term goal is to work with Interflex, frankly, to end up with what I would call a standard offering or a productization of the cleanest cycle, like a product as it were. So someone wants a product, they, they don't wanna find out they have to go through eight months of analysis and get a custom, you know, a custom engineered package. We like to be able to say that, hey, if you're looking for a solution for waste heat to power from a gas turbine for applications in the power industry, and also the same application, same technology can work for applications for mechanical energy, with a gas turbine for, for mechanical energy to basically work on the compressor stations at a pipeline, we have a product for you. That's our goal to get to the point where we have a product offering, not an engineering study, but rather a product offering. 
And the current underway work that we're having underway with Interflex right now, it's in the final stages of selecting all that major equipment, as I mentioned earlier, in that competitive process that will provide us with fixed pricing, firm pricing. And this will give Interflex and ourselves the basis upon which we can begin to market and respond to requests for tenders on pricing. This will be the first time ever that we can actually be proactive, and Interflex can be proactive, in going out there and marketing a product that's available for, a, for now, frankly, it's not, it's not available for every gas turbine on the planet. It's not available for every gas turbine in every market, but there are a lot of market opportunities for gas turbines within the power industry and within the mechanical engineer, uh, mechanical uh, uh, energy applications for pipeline compression. In North America alone, let alone other markets, we will have a product that we can go after uh, and market. And that's a, that'll be the first time in the country's in the, in the uh, sorry in the company's history that we'll ever have been in such a position. And then, of course, the plan is to then try to take that same approach into geothermal applications, and then applications for other waste industrial waste heat to power, whether it's cement, steel industries. Uh, petrochemical industries and the like. There's a range of applications that we've earmarked and identified that we will want to work through so we can end up with product offerings, modularized packages of the Kalina cycle that can be delivered to customers with confidence. With Kalina's history of building plants around the world with different industrial applications, uh, such as cement, steel, petrochemical, etc., what other opportunities are you seeing in Alberta for the technology? Well, in Alberta specifically, because this is where our team is right now, right? This is where the team is. And we are often being asked, well, why aren't you looking at other markets? Well, that's been the problems in the past that were made. Uh, frankly, you know, I'm not looking, we're not looking at the rear view mirror, but we'd be foolish to, to not learn from the mistakes of the past. We have a limited amount of resources and we have to go after markets, which are what we call, I like to call addressable. We have a team and we have partners in Alberta where we can address a market. Now we're going after this one application we talked about, right? Which is the gas turbines for power and for pipeline gas compression. The province on the other hand is drawing us in very actively, very actively, we have, we'll have more to talk about in this in the future, but they're bringing us very actively to be looking at opportunities for geothermal. Both the federal government and the provincial government of Alberta have made geothermal a, a big priority for their ideas of, you know, zero emissions base load power to the extent that they can maximize geothermal resources. So this is a big opportunity for our company and we're recognized in Alberta right now because we have a presence there and we're being recognized for that opportunity. The other one I think which is, which, which is also there, and let's not forget it, is, you know, Alberta is known for oil stands. And because it's known for oil sands, it also carries with it the taint of, you know, a significant carbon footprint on Alberta's economy. So there are significant steps underway to adopt technologies that can be shown to reduce the carbon footprint of that energy intensive industry. And we're seeing and we're getting calls, we're getting engagement with the government, with the universities, with industry to look at opportunities on the oil sands for the use of the Kalina cycle. So just moving on to some uh, some corporate questions, Ross. Um, can you clarify Kalina's funding situation with the delays to the FNTP? I understand you were funded to, um, to FNTP previously. Is this still the case? And also note that the company can use the loan facility if required. Are you planning a capital raise or would it only be done if a very attractive offer came along such as a, a strategic investor? Geez, Alex, I couldn't have been, your, your questions are usually more succinct. So there's a lot of questions there. So let me see if I can, let me see if I can unbundle that. The first thing I would point out is that I think everyone should note that the delay on FNTP has also resulted in a delay of the outlay, outlay of some cash items. And our cash position today has not been that adversely impacted. Uh, from from what we had earlier forecasted. So those delays have also re resulted in, yes, we've certainly spent more money in some things than we would have otherwise, but the bottom line is our cash position is not adversely impacted as a result of some of those delays because, frankly, some, some of the cash outlays have not yet been made. So that's one thing I just want some 
of your listeners to understand. Um, the other point, I think you mentioned a loan facility. We don't have a loan facility, but rather the, I think that must relate to, or must be in reference to the equity facility that we have with Longstate. And I can uh, confirm with you that that is still in place. Uh, it is still available uh, to us if we need it. And we've always thought it was a very good thing to have in the event that the markets were not there. We don't want to use this as a, as a way of raising money, but we want to make sure that it is there if the need ever arose that we had to bridge ourselves through to something to make sure that our program stayed, uh, stayed in place. So that is also there. Now, our cash needs and our financing needs, while they are integrated, they have different, uh, there are different considerations here. We have a lot on our plate right now uh, in an effort to achieve the scale and I think realize the opportunity that's facing us. If, I mean, if a strategic investor or an accretive financing allowed us to better go after that prize, a bigger prize, we would of course consider it. But we would only consider it in the context of understanding the entire and the big picture. I mean, the big picture is, and I want everyone to recognize that if you, if you apart from the $8 million equity facility from Longstate that we have, between now and July, 2022, KPO stands to receive over $17 million from the exercise of options that we have and over $7 million from the proceeds at financial close when we get to FNTP. So, you know, um, if we're looking at any kind of an opportunity for financing, whether it's a strategic or whether it's an accretive proposal being put forward to us, it's not just about how do we you know, get through and make uh, and achieve what we need to achieve. We'll have to take it all into context as to how much that would be, why we'd be taking it. And it would have to be in an accretive fashion, I think, given the fact that we stand to see, we're sitting there with that much money available to us over the course of the next, uh, over the next course of the next, whatever that is, 16 to 18 months. So with the delay in FNTP, would the company look at putting to a shareholder vote the concept of extending the KPO double E option date to be consistent with those of management? No, I don't see that those being, I don't really believe that those are, uh, no, I don't, I don't see those as being relatable. In, in our opinion, the, the, the delay has not been material. Uh, and as such, it wouldn't warrant uh, such treatment, especially given my comments I just had about the timing of the cash proceeds that we think are going to be vitally important and available to the company. Ross, you previously stated that you will be able to push forward with your business plan without the need to raise further capital from shareholders. Is this the, is this still the case with the change in the FNTP date? Alex, I think uh, uh, you just used the word without the need to raise further capital from shareholders. We have been and we are managing our business in such a way as to avoid the need, the need to raise further capital from shareholders and only raise capital if there's an accretive strategy or a tangible use of such capital. Is it possible that we might be in a situation where we need to raise, you know, you know, a few million dollars? It's possible. Uh, is it possible that we're going to sit there and, and be in a situation where we need to raise, you know, five or ten million dollars? No. We want to avoid being in a situation where we need to raise any kind of significant amount of money. The timing, the exact and final timing of all of this, um, we'll, we'll have to see how it all pans out. Ross, has there been any presentation of KPO's potential to Canadian investor groups? And if so, what would their appetite be? And would they, what would they need to see to get behind the stock? And I guess, uh, I guess the question that, we've received quite a lot from investors. Is a dual listing on the TSX on the cards? Sorry, well, yes. We can deal with it. Sorry, Ross, we can, I can, I can deal with the first aspect of the question first. Has there been sure. any presentation um, to Canadian investor groups? Well, yes, in fact, there has been, and frankly, for some time. Um, members of our team uh, are well known to the Canadian investment community. And frankly, m many of them have expressed for like a very strong interest. Uh, in getting behind this story if uh, several things are in place. And, you know, the markets are up and their markets are down. And uh, when we were talking to some of these folks, you know, well over a year ago, there was uncertainty around uh, the clean tech sector. It was really hot for a while and everyone thought it was going to fade off. And of course, it's continued to be very, very buoyant. So I think that would be one of the first and most important things. I mean, 
we're talking to uh, investment banks here who, you know, have heard, heard about the story, know know about us, who 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 are being proactive themselves in in, in talking to us and asking us about our plans. And frankly, um, one of the key things is their interest, I think, would be would be strong should the clean sector market remain buoyant and hot, uh, which it is. Uh, I think the second thing that they would want to know is that that we're achieving the milestones, especially for our primary site, uh, getting achieved. And um, and of course, those milestones are getting achieved, and they continue to be impressed with our as they call it, moving the ball down the field um, and our effectiveness, at, our effectiveness at doing that. So, so that interest does continue. And naturally, of course, anything that we can do with respect to partnerships and commercial deals being done. And while, and while the Siemens deal itself in and itself was not a, let's call it a partnership deal or even a commercial deal uh, for uh, uh, on the surface of it, um, it was a very important deal that got the attention of an awful lot of folks here in Canada and has heightened the profile and heightened the interest within the investment banking community here in uh, in Canada. I and think so you asked, the, also asked a question yeah, about... Yeah, the, the follow-up yeah. to, to that is, is a dual listing on the TSX on the cards? Well, you know, um, I, I, like to, I like to mention this, you know, because first of all, I'm a Canadian. I've spent an awful lot of time in Australia, and I would certainly say that the Australian markets have been very, very good to our company. And I'm not in, in, in a big hurry to make a change uh, to, uh, to, to come to a different, to a different uh, jurisdiction uh, just for the sake of making a change. It would have to have a very, very strong reason for making such a change. And it would have to, I think, have something to do with a transaction and have something to do with a meaningful engagement with an investment community. But whether that jurisdiction is the TSX or whether it's the uh, the junior markets exchange in the United States, um, these are all cards which are on the table, and uh, we have not made a decision one way or the other. Thanks, Ross. We've just had one question come through just um, on 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 the project. So, uh, are you in a position to uh, sort of talk about what the proposed or what the NPV uh, of each? 64 megawatt project might be. Well, how many listeners do we have on the phone or on this call right now, Alex? Just give me an idea. Uh, 36. Okay. I, I hope that all 36 will will certainly hear this and, and communicate it to other folks. Okay. In the past, I know that a lot of companies in a lot of different industries on the ASX have been able to project and express what their views of the net present values of a transaction or a find or a mineral resource or a business transaction might look like. We were under an awful lot of pressure in order to do that some 18 months ago, and we tried to do that, and we had our hands slapped royally by the ASX. And I think quite rightly so. The ASX has limitations on what companies such as ourselves are able to do in terms of providing forecasting. Forecasts on uncontracted projects is not something they allow to do, let alone, let alone provide a net present value indication calculated by ourselves as to what that might be. If someone else wants to try and take a stab at that and do an independent research to be able to suggest what those values are, they're welcome to do that. But the company's not in a position to be able to answer a question like that. Thanks, Ross. Look, that's all the time that we have. Uh, we've got through a stack of questions and they've been, um, you, you, your responses have been fantastic. So we really appreciate you jumping on to uh, to provide those responses for us. Before I let you go, uh, Ross, is there any, any high-end comments that you want to leave us with before we go today? Yeah, I just want to let everybody understand, and by the way, I'm so appreciative of the support that we've had from so many of our investors and, and many of them long-term investors uh, in what we're doing. And all I can tell you is, we're just continuing to get uh, more and more engagement with commercial partners, industry, financial groups, and we're being pulled. We're being pulled away from our focus on developing our projects into providing our technology. And at the end of the day, that's why we're all doing this. Let's all, I want everyone to understand, why are we developing these projects? We're developing the projects to make money. Why are we trying to make money? 
we're not trying to make money just so that on our projects that we can prov provide a dividend. We're trying to make money with these projects with which to have a foundation to then turn around and begin to deploy this technology in North American markets and markets in Europe and in markets overseas and in Asia and elsewhere. That's what we're trying to do. That's been our plan all along. And it's very, very encouraging for our team, myself in particular, to see the level of engagement we're getting from industry and government alike to draw us into this other, these other activities. We're, we're just really excited about that. And while we want to just jump off the, the cliff and, and, uh, and hold our nose and go for it, uh, we're trying to still do that with a discipline, enough discipline, enough discipline that is consistent with our approach uh, and, and, and being good fiduciaries of the uh, and, and uh, stewards of the company, but at the same time recognizing that there's a great window of opportunity. We feel the wind in our sails, and we're really excited. Fantastic, Ross. As I said, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to answer some questions today, uh, and thank you all for your attendance as well. We've had quite a, a significant um, interest in in this uh, in Kalina, obviously, and uh, and and this format. So I really appreciate you all uh, providing some questions. Uh, as I mentioned, um, a copy of the webinar will be available on the Kalina website and social media platforms later today. Uh, you can still download the quarterly reports by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel or you can download it from the ASX platform. Uh, Ross, again, thank you very much for joining me and uh, to all those who uh, joined us as well, thanks very much for your attendance and uh, hopefully we'll be speaking to you soon. Bye for now. Thanks, Alex.